Russell made some statements about William Wilberforce that are simply factually inaccurate. William Wilberforce was a moral absolutist, a moral immediatist, but he was a strategic and tactical incrementalist. The very fact that William Wilberforce started out fighting the slave trade, not slavery, is a function of the fact, folks. He didn't have the votes, and he could count. He knew he didn't have the votes, and so he went after what he thought he could get, and that was the slave trade. And while he was doing that, he supported legislation that redesigned, forced a redesign of the slave ships. Just as Texas recently, and, and Russ dissed this, he, 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 he belittled it, Texas is saving babies' lives by requiring abortion clinics to be redesigned in exactly the same way Wilberforce and the abolitionists supported legislation to require slave ships to be redesigned and they made arguments related to uh, pain among the slaves, pain and suffering, as well as the lives of the slaves. They said, well, we can't end the slave trade. Let's at least try to mitigate some of the pain and suffering. And that was an incredibly shrewd thing to do because in that era, when, when black people, when surgery was performed on black people, they weren't given anesthesia. You know why? It was assumed they couldn't feel pain because it was assumed that they were subhuman. And just getting people to think about the fact that black people could feel pain, that they could suffer, went a long way toward convincing the British people that these were human beings entitled to rights of personhood, which is exactly the same thing we do with this pain-capable legislation. Historically, people associate uh, the ability to register pain with humanity and entitlement to rights of personhood. Russ talks this down. I mean, he, just, he goes way out of his way to talk down the pain-capable legislation, as well as out of his way to talk down uh, the requirements that abortion be regulated through abortion clinic design. His argument isn't with me, it's with William Wilberforce. I love Russ. Russ loves William Wilberforce so much. Have you ever said, is anybody here, show of hands, do you know what Russ's email address is? Two great objects, William Wilberforce, and William Wilberforce supported slave ship design. That's an incremental deal. And William Wilberforce also supported legislation that banned slave traffic from, uh, from foreign ports, limiting slave traffic so it could only be uh, involved British ports. Again, incremental, totally incremental. William Wilberforce's last speech to Parliament spoke in favor of compensating slave owners for the emancipation of their slaves. And he was annihilated by other abolitionists for that. He was seen as a, a sellout, a compromise kind of guy. You know why he did it? And Russ talked it down three or four times in his presentation, compensating slave owners. We don't do that. We're abolitionists, immediate, blah, blah, blah. Wilberforce did it because he didn't have the votes. He knew that he had to do it to get the votes. And, and now we weren't talking about the, the abolition of the slave trade. We were talking about the abolition of slavery. And to get the votes, he said, okay, we will compensate the slave owners. I don't mind Russ disagreeing with all of this. But don't say it didn't happen. Don't claim people like William Wilberforce as immediatists when he was not an immediatist from a strategic and tactical point of view. He was absolutely an immediatist, as I am, from a moral point of view. But Russ is confusing those two things. Abraham Lincoln, some of you may, may not be aware of the fact, Abraham Lincoln had the Emancipation Proclamation on his desk for months while slaves were dying and he didn't issue it because public opinion wouldn't support it. He was waiting for victories on the battlefield that would give him the political momentum he needed to build a consensus that the Emancipation Proclamation 
should be issued. And then when he did, finally did issue it, it only freed the slaves in the Confederate states. It didn't free the slaves in the border states. Why? Because tactically and strategically, he was afraid that if he freed the slaves in the border states, they would lead, they would secede. They Break, would, that's time. They, they, would, they would go to the Confederacy. Rust hails, and rightly so, Abraham Lincoln is the great emancipator. Abraham Lincoln was an incrementalist and a compromiser because he knew when he had the votes and he knew when he didn't. Thank you. And Russell, I'm not going to let you get away with this, my friend. Read Metaxas' biography of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce gave that speech to Parliament in which he advocated paying slave owners in compensation for freed slaves just weeks before his death. I mean, he was so weak that people could hardly hear what he was saying. He, he, he wasn't doing that because he wanted to do it. He wasn't doing it because he, li he liked the idea of it. He was doing it because he didn't have the votes to get abolition without compensation. It was just as simple as that. It wasn't a compromise of moral principle. It was a strategic move. As Abraham Lincoln made a strategic move in not emancipating all the slaves, only emancipating the slaves he thought he could get away with and still preserve the Union. Let me very quickly say to you that the history of social reform is the history of both immediatism and incrementalism, going all the way back to John Adams, going all the way back to the Founding Fathers, the Constitutional Convention. John Adams, Massachusetts, hated slavery, but he knew he had to let it into the Constitution or there would be no union, because without Virginia, there would be no union. Without South Carolina, there would be no union. And the consequence of no union was that the southern colonies, now southern states, would become a slave-holding nation, two separate nations, a northern nation and a southern nation. And it was the goal of the southern nations to take slavery all the way down south through Central America into Brazil, which was then the largest slave-owning center, slave-trading center in the hemisphere. And they wanted all of the territories all the way to the Pacific Ocean that were not yet states to become slave-owning states. And so the abolitionists at the Constitutional Convention knew that if they didn't let slavery in, there would be no union. And with, without a union, there was no hope of ending slavery. And because there was a union and because time was bought for the North to become strong enough to face down the South, slavery ended up being defeated. But even after the Civil War, even after the slaves were set free, they weren't free because they were forced to become sharecroppers, most often on the same plantations, living under the same circumstances they had when they were in, involved with slavery. One of Russell's big criticisms of the pro-life movement is that every time we save this baby, we're, we're, we are arguing by inference that it's okay to kill those babies. That's an absurd argument to make. When William Wilberforce said, we're going to redesign the slave ships to minimize the pain and suffering for the slaves, no reasonable person would say that Wilberforce was by implication saying the slave trade was okay if you did it on a comfortable slave ship. Nobody made that argument. It's an absurd argument. It's exactly the argument that Russell is making about abortion, that if we save that baby, somehow we're condoning the slaughter of that baby. Simply not true. When Martin Luther King worked in 1964 for public accommodation for black people, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he wasn't saying, but it's okay to deny black people voting rights. Then in 1965, he passed the Voting Rights Act. He wasn't saying, well, now we've got the vote, but it's okay for housing discrimination to take place. In 1968, the Fair Housing Act passed. It was an incremental process. And King wasn't saying, because we've won public accommodation rights, voting discrimination is OK. He took it one step at a time. You know why? He didn't have the votes to do it all at once. He did it as quickly 
as he possibly could. What's the next question for us? The next question is a related question. You didn't address the question that I asked earlier, which is that was William Wilberforce, when he supported legislation to redesign the slave ships, mm -hmm. was he saying then that slaves transported on those ships yeah. are being transported morally? That's, that, did no, he, he did wasn't. he make it more difficult to abolish the slave trade by doing that? No, he wasn't. I already said that. Well, then why am I doing that? No, see, he, he, an abolitionist, another MP, authors a bill and says, hey, you know what? We're all being, we're, you, the whole culture and the whole House of Parliament is being deceived into all this incremental nonsense and slave trade is going on. Wilberforce, in his own words, says they start, past, they start dealing with these things. In Eric Metaxas, I didn't bring Eric Metaxas' book because it's like kind of a popular book, but like I do have Pollock's book. And he does say, I became convinced because of these bills that we could, no, we could no longer do any of this regulation. It's in his stuff. In the 1807, I, you can take this with you. In the letter on abolition of the slave trade, in 1807, on page 254, immediate abolition preferable to gradual in the of West. Of course Indies. it is, but he pursued both, Russell. No, this is, he we pursued, quoted it. He pursued both. You can't change his voting no, record. Well, no, you're right. I didn't say he was both, perfect. He spoke weeks before his death. He spoke in favor of compensating. What's the last slave thing? Owned. Hold on, Russ. You don't get to ask questions. Yeah. He, sure. question. Next question. Sure. He spoke sure. in favor of compensate, not because he was in favor he of denounced, it. Did he denounce what? compensation? I'll just state he it. He totally the denounced it. He denounced he he compensation. Right. But he knew and he published right. a Hold on, Russ. Hey, Russ in and, favor. That's hey, an answer. Russ, question. you're conflating two things. Clever strategy, but it won't work with me. You're conflating two things. He was a moral immediatist. He denounced compensation for these guys, but he knew he didn't have the votes to get abolition if he didn't put it in. And so he spoke in favor of it. Read Metaxas. He's reading right out of the parliamentary record. He's reading the transcripts of the speeches. Mm -hmm. You can't change Wilberforce's voting record. Wilberforce again and again voted for incremental regulation of the slave trade, not because he wanted it, not because this he liked it. This is a statement. It. Anytime Wilberforce did that, he was wrong. And well, then you better Wilberforce change believed. your email address. You better change your no, email No, the two address. great objects were not about this. The reformation of manner and the abolition of the slave trade? Yeah. I have two great objects. It's the deobjectification of women and the abolition of human abortion. It's not a Wilberforce William reference. Wilberforce, it's my two objects. Was Thank William you. Wilberforce both an, a, a, an absolutist, uh, an immediatist, and an incrementalist? As I said in the presentation, his error was dealing with the trade and then slavery. He thought that if you cut off the trade, slavery would perish. Was Lincoln wrong to be both an, an immediatist and an incrementalist? I agree with what Harriet Tubman said whenever they asked her about Lincoln. She said, well, Lincoln, this war is going to keep on going until he makes the right decision and says he's going to abolish slavery. This is after the Emancipation Proclamation. She was asked, what's the deal? What do you think about this? And she said, if Lincoln decides to kill the snake, the war will be over, slavery will be abolished. But the thing is, is you never wound a snake because it will always jump back up and bite you. Was I believe Lincoln repented as well. <laughs> Let him ask Lincoln, the next question, Russ. And Lincoln, what, here's the, here's the answer. Lincoln himself does not credit the incrementalist, the colonizationist, or any of those people with the abolition of slavery. He credits the Garrisonians. And you know what? This is a little high-minded. Let the him ask his next question, we're Russ. So bad hey, is Russell, we're was Martin Luther King both an incrementalist and an immediatist? In the sense that you're saying? or In, in any sense. Uh, he believed that racial inequality was sin and preached a gospel of freedom. So yeah. he's an immediatist. He was an immediatist and he was an incrementalist because he didn't go after all of this simultaneously. Oh, well, yeah, it, that's fine. That's, took it, that's fine. Right, he took it one step at a time. So what I hear you saying that's fine. is that um, Wilberforce was wrong on incrementalism. Abraham Lincoln was wrong on incrementalism. Martin Luther King was wrong on in incrementalism. Okay. It, well, Martin Luther King was an incrementalist. He, he was not an You know what immediatism and incrementalism so what's the next, are? The differences are? What's the next question? Russell, question. 
Do you understand the difference between a moral immediatist yes, I've read and a strategic? Forsyth's book. Right, right. but he, Forsyth isn't the only one who understands this. Yeah. Why, why do you persist in conflating those two concepts as though they're the same thing? Because if you claim to be a moral immediatist and undermine your moral immediatism, you are what the Word of God says, someone who perverts justice. Undermine. I wonder if these children who are alive today, because we passed this incremental legislation, I wonder if they're going to think we undermine I don't the know cause anything about them. Is this a question? <laughs> 